Hey guys, thank you for joining us and listening to the Dave Dynasty Show. Before we get started today, make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Dave Dynasty. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash the Dave Dynasty, or if you're on there, just do at the Dave Dynasty. Of course, subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash the Dave Dynasty. Subscribe to the podcast on all podcast platforms. Just look up Dave Dynasty Show and you will find the feed for all of the Dynasty Wrestling Podcast Network episodes. If you'd like to contribute to the show, you can do that by going to prowrestlingtees.com slash the Dave Dynasty and buying a shirt that helps us out. Or if you would just like to make a contribution, go to paypal.me slash the Dave Dynasty. Anything helps. It all goes back into the show, keeps it free for you. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe and review and share. Now, let's get to the show. Supporting, bruiser loving, positivity spreading, world's most dangerous podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty as he supports and promotes Midwest pro wrestling. Keep on growing with the Midwest Express. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. I am your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to another episode here on the Dynasty Wrestling Podcast Network. And unfortunately, we have to have another episode where we pay tribute to a fallen wrestler. Today, we are going to discuss the golden boy, Paul Christie, a mainstay of Midwest professional wrestling, particularly in the WWA. Uh, Also a standout at uh, the Poffo's ICW in Kentucky. Uh, He recently passed away, and a lot of people are not familiar with Paul Christie, and they should be. Uh, We have a friend of the show, John Lawson, back on. He's going to provide all the information and background on Paul Christie's career. He's going to tell you his accomplishments and bring you up to speed on it. Uh, Our thoughts go out to Christie's wife, uh, Bundy Love, and any of his family and friends out there. This is a tough time. Uh, I always hate... These losses in wrestling, they're tough to do. And and I always like doing these episodes to make sure we pay tribute and shine a little light on their careers and their accomplishments. But it, but it's always painful to, to do them. And, and I'd be very happy if I didn't have to do another. Uh, so uh, anyway, our thoughts are with Bunny and uh, their family. And we're remembering Paul Christie today. So let's take a break and uh, come back. And we'll discuss that. Hi there, wrestling fans. We have a tremendous card for you, and we'll bring you our first event immediately following this important and formative interlude. The man that excites your soul. Who is he? The one and only. The golden boy. The champion of the world. This company, Miss Bunny Love. All right? This personality. You notice I'm dressed up, had my walking cane, dressed up, had my nice little sport coat. $1,200 $1,200 sport coat. Still have it here. Still have it. Beat the macho man, Randy Savage. The macho man. Still have it here. Still the heavyweight champion of the world. You know, recent talk about the wrestling world that Christy has used foreign objects or for some reason that I'm carrying the cane because I might want to hit somebody or sneak up behind somebody. You know, I don't need the cane. I don't need the cane. It's just classy. I'm a classy guy. Do not need the cane, Miss Bunny. You may hold that cane. It has also gotten out through the wrestling world that Christie, for some reason, he'll do anything to win. That things appear. Things disappear. 
How in the world could I possibly stand in there in the middle of the ring and have things appear? They claim that all of a sudden, a cane enters my hand. When Miss Bunny takes the cane back, a cane, a cane, a cane. Are you believing the lying eyes of yours? You actually believe what you've seen? I was standing here and all of a sudden, a, a cane appears? Some people have said, I could possibly be a warlock. Not true. You know what I have? I have desire. I have determination. I have something that other wrestlers don't have. Something you can't see. Something that you can't see. Can you see heart? Can you see soul? Can you see something that a person wants to win desire? Can you see things like that? Like you can see this cane? Yes, there's a lot of things in the wrestling business. Comes from here. Guts. Let me show you something, a little demonstration, kiddies out there. To show you what I mean, talking about the brain. The brain is so powerful. So very, very powerful. That's why I win all the time. These other wrestlers, they don't, they don't think that they can win. That's why they can't win. I'm going to give you a little demonstration here. Ms. Bunny, I'll just put this other cane here. I want you to use your imagination now. Remember, getting a ring in the ring with Paul Christie. Me looking you in the eye and telling you, you can't beat me. At that point, I have you psyched out. What is it? There's other wrestlers that are fantastic. Macho Man Savage. The guy's good. Talent-wise, probably equal. He's fast, yes. I'm fast. Yeah, he's good. He's real good. But you know what he doesn't have that I have? Two things. This, number one. The Eye of the Tiger. On May 24th, 2021, we lost a mainstay of, of professional wrestling in the Midwest, and most specifically of the World Wrestling Association, when golden boy Paul Christie passed away after a lengthy illness at the age of 82 in the state of Michigan. With this piece for the Dave Dynasty Show, I want to share my memories of Christie as we take a deep look into his accomplishments and most memorable matches. He was a three-time WWA Tag Team Champion that was a beloved good guy inside the ring for the vast majority of his career, and then reinvented himself after a heel turn that placed him in more main events than he ever had as a babyface. It seems as if he were always billed as weighing 222 pounds, inhaling from Evergreen Park, Illinois, and then later his hometown became Hickory Hills, Illinois, both suburbs of Chicago. As a babyface, he always wore traditional black trunks and black boots, and usually a black vest or a gold vest since he was, after all, the golden boy which is a term used to describe someone who shows great success at an early age. After turning heel, he still often wore black, but then he often wore, frequently wore yellow boots and yellow trunks. Paul, or Chris, as he was affectionately referred to by his friends and peers, including his own wife, ballet-slash-wrestler Miss Bunny Love, began his career in his home base of the Chicago area back in 1960. His actual last name was Christerson, but that was shortened to Christie when he began his professional career. By the mid to, to late 1960s, he was a perennial mid-card babyface working in the Indianapolis Territory, always as a clean-cut babyface who became very popular with the fans. Along the way, he ventured into other territories, such as the AWA and St. Louis, but he also worked the Alabama area, where he was paired with Ken Lucas, as his brother, Chris Lucas, and the team held several tag team championships in the mid to late 60s. In 1971, Christie won his first WWA championship when he teamed with Wilbur Snyder to defeat the fabulous Kangaroos, Al Costello and Don Kent, with their manager George Crybaby Cannon in Indianapolis. They held the belts for about three months before losing the title to Black Jack Lanza and Black Jack Mulligan under the management of Bobby Heenan. Snyder and Christie actually lost the title twice to the Black Jacks, first in Detroit in November of 1971, and then the title change was repeated about six weeks later in Indianapolis. It was nearly six years later before Christie won another title in the WWA, and that was a title change that was not originally scheduled to happen. On a big Indianapolis show in February 1977 that was held at the larger Market Square Arena instead of the usual Expo Center, Christie teamed with Moose Cholock against the Bounty Hunters, Jerry and David Novak, with their manager, Cashbox Jim Kent. Although this was a tag title match, it was actually fourth from the top due to featuring Bruiser vs. Sheik in a cage match as the main event, WWA world champ The Strangler, who was Guy Mitchell under a mask against Bobo Brazil, 
and European champion Ivan Koloff, wrestling Wilbur Snyder, all promoted above the tag title bout. I don't believe the title change was planned for this card, as Christian Cholock did not have any build-up as a tag team heading into the match. Plus, the Bounty Hunters gave notice to Bruiser and Snyder when they arrived at the arena that they were going to be leaving in a month. And that did cause some heat with their manager. As I recall, my father, who worked for the Indiana State Athletic Commission, told me that night on the way home that Kent was not happy about them giving notice the way that they did because they didn't tell him in advance and he didn't have another territory lined up to move on to. They apparently patched things up since they continued to be a unit on and off for the next several years after this. When Cholock splashed one of the bounty hunters for the three count to win the title that night, the crowd erupted in cheers and essentially gave them a standing ovation, the type of celebration that was usually only seen occasionally for some of Bruiser's triumphs. An interesting fact about Cholock and Christie becoming the tag team champions is that this marked the very first time that a babyface tag team championship team that did not involve Bruiser or Snyder as one or both of the tag champs. Christy and Cholock remained the only good guy tag team championship team that didn't include Bruiser or Snyder for years after this reign as well, as it wasn't until Spike Huber and Steve Regal were the champs in 1982 during the failed Memphis experiment. While Christy and Cholock were champs, the tag team belts were replaced. The old belts had an outdated look and were missing many of the letters and jewels, thus an upgrade was long overdue. Christy was the one who had the belts made, and they looked great. The only problem was, when I first saw them, I noticed that the inscription said United States Tag Team Champions instead of World Tag Team Champions. As a photographer in the WWA and publisher of my newsletters that covered the promotion, I saw this air and asked Christy about it. He simply said it was a mistake. I asked if they were going to have it fixed, and he said, yeah, probably later on. But they never were corrected, and the WWA tag team belts from that point on were still referred to as the World Tag Team Championship belts, even though they said United States on the actual straps. The belts continue to be used through the transition where the WWA World Tag Team Championship was defended in the Memphis Territory and then until the demise of the WWA after that. Christy and Cholock held the belts for a few months before dropping them to Jimmy and Johnny Valiant, now under the management of Major Duke George. Soon after this title change, Christy was moved down the card working preliminaries and sometimes even opening matches, although he was still winning the majority of his matches. During this time, Christie began teaming with another WWA original, Spike Huber, not exactly on a regular ba- basis, but from time to time on cards throughout the territory in Indiana and Illinois. A major change for Christie occurred in August of 1978 in Indianapolis, when Christie and Huber were wrestling the team of Bulldog Don Kent and Madman Mitchell, who was Guy Mitchell, a wrestler who had more name changes than anyone in WWA history, ranging from the Assassin to the Strangler to Jerry Valiant, among several others. During the match, Christie turned on Huber for no real apparent reason, other than Christie refused to tag in when Huber needed him most. This brought upon a major change for Christie, who became a wrestling heel for the first time in his life, and was now managed by Duke George, and for the next two years, he was the top heel in the promotion. Christie feuded with Huber all over the WWA, including Chicago and singles and tag team matches that were usually one of the best matches on the card, if not the best match. After manager Duke George was fired from the promotion, Christie began being managed by Reverend Tiny Tim Hampton. And by the summer of 1979, he had two managers at the same time, Hampton and Miss Bunny Love. Bunny had met Christie at a wrestling show, and they soon became inseparable, becoming a real-life couple for the rest of his life. Bunny was young and new to the business, but at this point in time, a woman manager or valet was very rare, and the fans immediately hated her just because of her association with Christy, even though initially she really didn't interfere in any of his matches. As time went on, Christy taught her the tricks of the trade and even trained her to wrestle, which she did for the next couple of years in the WWA. At first, Bunny was simply called Miss Bunny, but Christy wanted her to have a good wrestling name for her la- for her last name. While in the dressing room for a card in Terre Haute, Christy was in a conversation with my dad about naming Bunny. My dad told him that there was a well-known go-go dancer years earlier in, in our town that went by the name of Bunny Love. 
Now, I'm pretty sure that go-go dancer was the equivalent of a stripper back then, and Bruiser once owned a strip club in Terre Haute called the Harem House, similar to what he had in Indy. I was just a kid when that business was in operation in Terre Haute, but the building still stands to this day, recently being remodeled and opening up as a piercing studio and jewelry store. Christy loved the name, and from that point on in wrestling, Christy's future wife became known as Miss Bunny Love. In 1979, Nature Boy Roger Kirby and the Russian stomper Igor Volkov held the WWA tag team title. Igor Volkov had previously worked the WWA as Soldier LeBeouf with Jacques Goulet as the Legionnaires. Volkov had also been a mainstay with a few Canadian promotions, and after the Legionnaires gimmick ended, he went to the WWF as Lumberjack Pierre as part of the tag team championship team as of the Yukon Lumberjacks. Volkov left the WWA on his own regard, I think to work for George Goulas of all promotions, which caused the WWA tag title to become vacant with the storyline being that Volkov was injured and unable to wrestle anymore. This departure led to the formation of a much better tag team combination when Christie became the regular partner of Roger Kirby, and the team was managed by both Bunny Love and Tiny Hampton. In June of 1979, the team of the Golden Boy and the Nature Boy won the WWA tag team belts twice. On Indianapolis TV, the June card was promoted as having a match to determine the new tag team champs, with the two top contending teams of Christy and Kirby wrestling the team of Wilbur Snyder and Spike Huber to crown the new champs. At the same time that this match was being promoted, I found out from my newsletter's Fort Wayne correspondent and current listener to the Dave Dynasty show, Tim Tassler, that a tag team tournament to crown new champs was being advertised for the Fort Wayne card that took place the night before, perhaps a few days before the Indianapolis show. Backstage when taking pictures, when Christy and Kirby were in the gorilla position to head out to the ring for the next match, I approached Christy and asked him about the tournament and if he and Kirby were the tag team champions. I had become friends with Christy and Bunny, and of course I knew Kirby, but I was much closer to Christy and had known him for a longer period of time. He knew that I produced my newsletter, and he refused to tell me who won the tournament. He smiled real big and said, I can't tell you that. I said something like, come on, you can tell me. I'm going to find out sooner or later when the report comes in the mail from my correspondent. But Christy protected kayfabe that day, although he did acknowledge that he and Kirby were in the finals of the Fort Wayne tournament. I think that he had determined that he wasn't breaking kayfabe by telling me that much. As I suspected and had predicted that night in Indianapolis, Christy and Kirby beat Snyder and Huber, and Christy became half of the WWA Tag Team Champions one more time. While holding the belts, Christy immediately transitioned into a feud with Bruiser for the WWA world title, making the first time that Christy was in a singles main event program in the city's in the WWA's main city. He didn't come out on top in their main events, and they really didn't draw very well. I attribute a lot of this lack of success to the way that Christy had been booked over the previous 15 years. He'd get some wins over the opponents that he definitely should beat, but he also lost to so many heels as they would come into the territory. As a result, he didn't seem like the same type of threat that the likes of a Brody, Sheik, Ladd, Von Raschke, Koloff, to name a few, were viewed. And to be perfectly honest, that is rightfully so. Christy was always in exceptional condition, and he took his appearance very seriously. But at only five foot nine inches, he was not very tall to be seen as a physical threat. And the fact that both he and the Bruiser had been around for so long, that didn't help matters either. It just wasn't something that was fresh in the eyes of the fans. Christy and Kirby's reign ended in the fall of 1979 when Bruiser and Huber won the belts in the match that marked Huber's first championship win of his career. After losing the belts, Christy and Kirby rarely teamed with one another, and Christy wrestled in more singles matches than tags. But when he did tag team matches, he teamed with the likes of Jerry Valiant, Jerry Graham Jr., the great Abdullah, and Tiny Hampton. In 1973, Christy was not wrestling in the WWA, but I soon found out where he was. That year, Terre Haute established a new TV station when an ABC-affiliated UHF station came on the air. I can remember when the local newspaper ran a story on the programming that would be featured on Channel 38. One of the shows mentioned was Pro Wrestling, with a description that, that read, featuring Dick the Bruiser and all those other fakers. A week later at midnight on Friday nights, the wrestling program began, 
but it was not the Indianapolis show. Instead, it was Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling out of Paducah, Kentucky. This program featured the likes of Sweet Daddy Watts, Plowboy Frazier, Gentleman Saul Weingroff, and the Von Bronners. And the champion of the promotion was none other than Golden Boy Paul Christie, who was building up a title match against Angelo Poffo. The program only lasted a few months before it was dropped by the station or perhaps the promotion stopped providing a tape. They never ran a live event show in Terre Haute. None of the promos between the matches advertised any live events, so they were not necessarily trying to run opposition to Bruiser. During this time, there was a young fan in attendance at a wrestling show in Terre Haute who recognized my mother as being his school teacher from a few years prior in elementary school. I remember my mother asking him, if he had a favorite wrestler, and the kid replied, Yes, Crystal Ball. I thought he was saying something like Crystal Ball, but after he left, my mother said that she's pretty sure that he meant Paul Christie. So I think there must have been a few fans that watched this outlaw promotion. Christie had other memorable matches that seem more like yesterday to me rather than 40 to 50, almost 50 years ago. Terre Haute was a great town for Paul Christie, and he was in more main events and semi-main events than probably any other wrestler and this was likely his best town for working on top. Now, you might think that it was Bruiser or Snyder that probably had more main events than him in this town, but you have to realize that Bruiser rarely worked towns the size of Terre Haute in the 60s and early 70s, as he was in great demand working in larger cities across the United States and abroad, and this made his one or two appearances a year in Terre Haute something special that would help pop the house. Snyder similarly was working matches outside the territory in the AWA and NWA cities in the 60s and early 70s as well. Plus, he didn't work every card in Terre Haute. In 1976, Terre Haute featured a main event that I don't think was repeated anywhere in the territory. Pepper Gomez was the singles champion, and that spring, he defended the title against none other than Paul Christie. This was the first and only time that I know of that a baby-faced WWA champion defended against a babyface challenger in the, in the history of our promotion. The only other match in WWA lore that fits this description was when Stormy Granzig defeated Spike Huber for the WWA title in a phantom title change when Bruiser running, ran his son-in-law out of the territory and attempted to run him out of wrestling. When Gomez wrestled Christie, both men were cheered evenly at the introductions, but when the match went on, they didn't exactly turn against Gomez, but they certainly rallied their support solidly behind Christie, hoping to see a title change. When Gomez came back to the territory for the singles championship run, the sleeper hole became his finisher. That hole was always Paul Christie's signature move. But once that hole was presumably assigned to Gomez, Christie was not allowed to use it in Indianapolis, but the title match was billed as a battle of the sleeper holds on TV. Christie frustrated Gomez by out-wrestling him scientifically to the point that Gomez started grabbing the ropes to force breaks, and that did raise some boos from the fans. At another point, Gomez seemed content with trying to ride out the clock on the 30-minute time limit match by making himself small, getting on his hands and knees and having his hands clasped behind his neck to prevent any holds to his head being applied. Gomez made himself resemble a turtle with his extremities enclosed in his shell or as close as a human can resemble a turtle. The end of the match came when the men turned up the pace and ended up tumbling over the top rope together where they were counted out of the ring. They ended up shaking hands and hugged one another back in the ring for the end of the match announcements. But three weeks later on the next card in Terre Haute, Christie was back in the second match on the card going over Mark Manson. Another memorable Terre Haute match involving Paul Christie occurred in the mid-70s when he was still a babyface. And I think it might have been a match against Sergeant Jacques Goulet or maybe it was the Strangler. It was definitely the main event of the night and when the match was over, Christie had been knocked nearly unconscious by his opponent, which I believe was a word KO or concussion. But after the match, that's where things really got strange. Christie was helped to his feet and from the ring, at which point he said he didn't need any more assistance. He took one or maybe two steps, and then fell face first to the floor of the armory. He got up and stumbled into the ringside chairs, with many of the chairs just scattering all over the place. Some fans came to his assistance, and security wasn't doing anything, but Christie started throwing punches into the air, swinging wildly with his head down. The fans moved away, and Christie fell into another section of the ringside seats, knocking many of them over. He laid there for a while, then got up and started swinging wildly again, and then fell to the floor again, lying there for what seemed like a couple of minutes. When he got up again with the assistance of some fans, he started swinging wildly, 
Only this time, a tall man, probably in his 30s, was standing a little too close and didn't back away, which resulted in Christy striking him in the face and nearly knocking him out. When the fan got up to his feet, he was visibly wobbly and pretty much in tears. I remember this being a really long night for us at the matches because my dad couldn't complete his paperwork since he needed to record the events that happened to the Athletic Commission. This was not anything against Christy. It was just my dad doing his job. He had to ask the fan if he wished to press charges against Christie. There were a couple of, with, of women with him, and one of them was telling him that he should indeed press charges since he was assaulted, while the other one told him that he should not press charges against Christie because he was hurt and didn't know what he was doing. The police that had worked security that night were long gone since maybe they were working by the hour, but the fan had decided not to press charges, and as far as I know, Christie did not face any repercussions from the promotion or the State Athletic Commission. I recall that my dad was not happy with what Christy did since he was endangering the fans, and he thought that Christy was going into business for himself, trying to create his own program or perhaps start a buzz among wrestling fans for what they had just witnessed. As I mentioned previously, Christy was a big fan favorite, and being a good-looking man, he certainly had a following with the female fan base. There was a woman in Indianapolis that took a special liking to Christy. This was when he was still a good guy, and he would sometimes come out of the dressing room when other matches were taking place to observe the other wrestlers' matches. That meant that some fans would approach him for autographs, or perhaps to talk about whatever. I remember this fan since she had become a good customer for me when selling my pictures at the arenas. She bought all kinds of pictures, but always a copy of everything that I had available to Christy. She was tall, thin, black hair, probably in her late 20s, but something that was really memorable was that she had a visible scar on her chest that you could see without her exposing any cleavage. She volunteered to tell me and many others that she had previously had health problems and that that had required open-heart surgery. I wouldn't describe her as a rat, but she was definitely interested in Paul Christie and in more ways than just wanting to collect his autograph and all of his pictures. Christie became aware that she wanted to date him, and in a moment that may have foreshadowed his heel turn that was still a couple of years away, he eventually told her that he couldn't sleep with her because he wasn't sure if her heart could survive an encounter with him. This fan also became a volunteer with a charitable organization, which may have been the American Cancer Society, that sold t-shirts and eight by tens of Bruiser and other wrestlers at the arenas. Now in the mid-70s, this was long before wrestling t-shirts were commonplace. After introducing the Bruiser shirt, they also showed, uh, sold Paul Christie shirts and later on sold Spike Huber shirts. The woman that I spoke of that was looking for an encounter with Christy became a volunteer with the people that sold the stuff so that she could begin traveling the circuit and hopefully to get some time with the Golden Boy. Christy was also an early proponent of merchandising. By around 1973 or so, he had poster-sized pictures made and purchased advertising space in magazines like the Ring Wrestling magazine. By the 1970s, Christie had ventured into hypnotism, but that was never merged into his wrestling career. Christie would put on seminars where people would be hypnotized as a means to stop smoking or perhaps lose weight. I never saw Christie attempt to hypnotize anyone, and whether there was anything to it, I have no idea. I used to think that it was just a gimmick, but I have attended hypnotism shows in places like Vegas, where I have to admit that some of the things that happen at those shows make me want to believe that maybe I'm just being a mark. One of these days, maybe I'll volunteer to see if they can hypnotize me, and if they can make me crow like a rooster, I'll be sure to let you know. After the Memphis experiment, where the WWA shut down and basically allowed Jerry Jarrett to run all the WWA cities, Christy came back for a few matches, but soon began spending most of his time working for Angelo Papo's ICW promotion based out of Kentucky. Christy eventually ended the long ICW world title reign of Macho Man Randy Savage in 1983 in a heel-versus-heel match that took place in Springfield, Illinois. A city that had been a stop for the AWA in the early 70s, became a WWA town in the mid to late 70s, and then apparently became an ICW city. Christy dropped the title Lanny Poffo, and some title histories indicate that Christy regained the belt and was the final world champion of the promotion when it closed down but he was not in the plans of the Memphis promotion when the Poffos went to work for Jarrett. There are some YouTube videos of Christy and ICW, and Miss Bunny went with him into the promotion. 
There was one particularly strange video that's online where Christy goes on and on from a promo, promo spot that goes way too long. But he does exhibit some of his magic trick capabilities. Christy eventually finished his career with a major promotion by working for a short period of time for the WWF. In the twilight of his wrestling career, he was no longer assigned the Golden Boy moniker, but instead was just simply Paul Christie. Christie was brought in to put over the big WWF stars of the day, but he did have a cringeworthy appearance on TNT, their Tuesday Night Titans program on USA Network, that was more of a variety talk show than a typical wrestling program. Christie was featured on a May 1986 broadcast that had Gene Okerlund as the guest host for Vince McMahon, who usually hosted the program. Christie came out to rant and rave and to show off some of his supposed magic tricks skills. At the time that I watched this in 1986 live, I thought that it was funny, but watching it again this past week, I have to say that it was kind of sad, and it was definitely WrestleCraft worthy. A few years ago, Christie also wrote and published his autobiography called The Many Faces of Paul Christie. It has to be a self-published book, and I really wish that Paul would have worked with someone like Scott Teal, whose Crowbar Press produces what I feel are the best wrestling biographies in the market. Even if Christie could not have worked with Scott Teal, I wish they'd reached out to me before printing this book, as I think I could have assisted in telling his story and editing it. The book does feature quite a few of my photos of Christie and Bunny, but a lot of details are missing. In 2005, Christie and Bunny became the first wrestling couple to be honored together at the Cauliflower Flower Alley Club, a nice honor for a wrestler whose prime was way before the national TV era, and, be, and because he spent most of his career working for smaller promotions, he's not as well known as many of his contemporaries. Out of all the wrestlers from the WWA that I started watching in the 1960s, I believe that we are only left with three living, with them being Black Jack Lanza, Baron Von Raschke, and Bob Boyer, better known as Chief Bull Eagle. From the early 70s, we don't have many more to add to that list. Jimmy Valiant and Jose Martinez are the only names that come to mind immediately. As we close this edition of the Dave Dynasty Show, I want to thank Paul Christie Christerson for his 30 years in the wrestling business and for providing me and many WWA fans with lasting memories. I'd been in touch with Bunny from time to time over the last couple of years and knew that Paul's health was in decline, but his passing did catch me by surprise, and I mourn his loss. Our thoughts are with you, Bunny, and as we say goodbye to one of the best to lace up the boots in the WWA, Golden Boy, Paul Christie. If you are looking for the best books, DVDs, and posters on classic wrestling nostalgia, then you want to visit crowbarpress.com. There are literally dozens of titles there, including biographies of the likes of Bruiser Brody, Ole Anderson, Ivan Koloff, and of course, Dick the Bruiser, as we have spoke about here on the Dave Dynasty Show. You want to visit crowbarpress.com for all of your classic wrestling nostalgia needs. Again, that is crowbarpress.com. All right, and there you have it. A look at the career of Paul Christie. Once again, our thoughts go out to his wife, Bunny Love, and their family. And uh, hopefully you'll go out and check out some of Christie's work. Look him up on YouTube. There are some matches on there. There's some clips on there. Uh, do yourself a service and, and watch some Paul Christie today and remember him and keep his family in your thoughts. Uh, we do thank you for joining us and listening. As you do every episode, uh, you heard all the social media links and such at the top of the show. Make sure you follow us on those and subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast. Once again, thank you, and we will see you next episode. And until then, be good, be safe, and keep on growing.